Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I think I'm just going to stand here like this. Can anybody hear me all right? Rather than go behind the desk there. Um, it's funny, I just I had, didn't know Peter was going to be here today. I thought I was going to see him later, but uh, um, I just taught a couple of your poems. Uh, so there's this weird synchronicity. Uh, I'm doing an anthology. I may say a little bit more about that, but I'm doing an anthology and he's in it. There's a couple of poems he has in it. Uh, a big anthology of poems that are about faith, uh, the life of faith in one way or another. Here's another poem that's in it, which is not by me. This is by a guy named Craig Arnold. And Craig was a friend of mine. And uh, the first time I saw Craig, it was in a, a reading at a little uh, university where I was teaching Lynchburg College in Virginia. And Craig was there as a visiting writer. I brought him in to read, and he showed up in black leather, all black leather pants, black, le black, black leather jacket, black motorcycle boots. And he had all of his poems memorized. And his poems at that time were these long, dramatic things. And he, he, and he just whipped around the room reciting these things. Shaved head, thin guy, very dynamic. And, and um, I'm usually a little put off by that kind of self-dramatization. But in him, I loved it. Uh, he, he, it, it, was, it was completely authentic. And Craig and I became friends over the years and stayed in touch. And we would see each other here and there and keep up. Um, Craig had a project to go around the world visiting volcanoes. In fact, you met Craig the last time I saw him. Um, and he was writing a, a, a combination memoir, book of poems, uh, weird hybrid work about all of these volcanoes. And he went to Japan and uh, um, he'd already been several places. And he was in Japan and he hiked up to this volcano, which was not an arduous hike, and somehow <coughs> vanished on a Sunday. And, uh, that Saturday, he had sent me this poem when I was editing Poetry Magazine. And I read it the next morning on a Sunday, and I thought, oh my god, that's incredible. I can't believe that. And immediately wrote him and, it, and sent him the acceptance that he never saw. Uh, he vanished at the same time that I sent that out. They never recovered Craig's body. They don't know what happened to him. Uh, he, they presume he had a horrible fall somewhere. Meditation on a grapefruit. I have no idea what Craig Arnold believed. We never talked about it. But if this doesn't count as faith, I don't know what does. Meditation on a grapefruit. To wake when all is possible before the agitations of the day have gripped you. To come to the kitchen and peel a little basketball for breakfast. To tear the husk like cotton padding a cloud of oil misting out of its pinprick pores clean and sharp as pepper. To ease each pale pink section out of its case so carefully, without breaking a single pearly cell. To slide each piece into a cold blue china bowl, the juice pooling until the whole fruit is divided from its skin, and only then to eat so sweet a discipline, precisely pointless, a devout involvement of the hands and senses, a pause, a little emptiness, each year harder to live within, each year harder to live without. It's a wonderful poem. Wonderful poem. I urge you to look up Craig's work. I used to live in Prague. It's been a long time, and I lived there right after the Velvet Revolution. Uh, and I lived with someone at the time, and we lived on the seventh floor of this building, Panilux, they're called in Czech. The, uh, it's a sort of grim, gray apartment buildings that surround so many Eastern European cities. Uh, it was horrible on the outside, but on the inside, we had this view of Prague. We're at the top of this uh, uh, top of this building, and I was 22 years old, and it was romantic and wonderful in some ways. One day, when I was sitting at the table studying Czech, and my girlfriend was taking a bath, a falcon landed on the windowsill, and it was quite literally this close to me, through a pane of glass. Uh, 
And 10 years later, after she and I had gone our separate ways, I wrote this poem. A poem can take a long time to gestate. Uh, I don't find that my experience usually translates into poetry with any sort of immediacy. Some people do, and it doesn't. It doesn't it's no, no slight against it, if that's what happens. Uh, it just seems to take a lot of knocking on my head. Postolka, which means falcon or kestrel. When I was learning words and you were in the bath, there was a flurry of small birds and in the aftermath of all that panicked flight, as if the red dusk willed a concentration of its light, a falcon on the sill. It scanned the orchard's bowers, then pain by pain it eyed the stories facing ours, but never looked inside. I called you in to see and when you'd steamed the room and naked next to me stood dripping as a bloom of blood formed in your cheek and slowly seemed to melt, I could almost speak the love I almost felt. Wish for something, you said. A shiver pricked my spine. The falcon turned its head and locked its eyes on mine and for a long moment I'm still in. I wished and wished and wished the moment would not end. And just like that, it vanished. So I grew up in West Texas, a little town called Snyder in far West Texas. I had a, so I, people ask me, a place like Yale asks this all, kind of thing all the time. I'm probably here too. How do you grow up? How does a poet come out of a place like that? Uh, it was a podunk little town. No books in my house. Um, this poem is an Ars Poetica. It's about, it's about uh, how one might become a poet in a place like this. It's called Five Houses Down. Uh, I, I literally had five houses down this character who's in this poem. This one's real enough. Uh, a sapper is someone who goes out and diffuses bombs. I, I use that in a different way in this poem, but that's basically all you know, except there is some very foul language in this poem. Um, it's art. It's art, man. <laughs> Can't help it. It's the way he talked. Five houses down. I loved his ten demented chickens and the hell-eyed dog. The mailbox shaped like a huge green gun. I loved the eyesore opulence of his five partial cars, the wonder cluttered porch with its oil spill plumage, tools called in oil, the dark clockwork of disassembled engines, christened sweet baby and benedicted old bitch. And down the steps into the yard the explosion of mismatched parts and black scraps amid which like a bad sapper cloaked in luck, he would look up stunned, patting the gut that slopped out of his undershirt and saying, son, you looking to make some scratch? All afternoon, we'd pile the flatbed high with stacks of Exxon floor mats mysteriously stenciled with his name. Rain-rotted sheetrock or miles of misfitted pipes, coil after coil of rusted fence wire that stained for days every crease of me, rollicking it all to the dump where, while he called every ragman and ravened junk dog by name, he cat-picked the avalanche of trash and fished some always fixable thing up from the depths. His endless Aimless work was not work, my father said. His bark-like earthquake curses were not curses, for he could goddamn a slipped wrench and shit fuck a stuck latch. But one bad word from me made his whole being twang like a nail misstruck. Ain't no call for that, son. No call at all. Slip not. What not? Not from which no man escapes. 
prestoed back to plain old rope, whip snake, black snake, deep in the worm dirt, worms like the clutch of mud. I wanted to live forever, five houses down in the womanless rooms a woman sometimes seemed to move through, leaving him twisting a hand-stitched dish towel or idly wiping the volcanic dust. It was heaven to me. Beans and weenies from paper plates, black-fingered tinkerings on the back stoop as the sun set, on an upturned fruit crate a little jam jar of rye like ancient light, from which once I took a single secret sip, my eyes tearing and my throat on fire. It's a poem about the way joy and grief are raveled up in each other. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about tonight is how uh, different facets of God are destitution and abundance, the two faces of God. And I sometimes think we're called to see the other, the other face most clearly when we're standing in the midst of one. When you're in the midst of destitution, you're meant to see the abundance or the joy that seems so impossible, though you can feel joy in the midst of suffering, you just can't feel happiness. And in the midst of joy, I think we're called to remember destitution or suffering, which can seem so remote in those moments. Uh, this is from this new book. Oh no, it's a little difficult here because I have the page numbers written down, I'm sorry. I'll put this right here. Keats has a letter. Uh, I can't remember exactly when it is, but he uh, he talks about how there's John Keats says there's different different kinds of reality, uh, and there are some things that don't really exist until we turn our attention to them. Uh, he uses love is the great example in that letter. The moon, confusingly, but. But uh, love is, makes sense. It doesn't really exist, if you think about it, until you turn your attention to it, then it comes into being. To turn from everything to one face is to find oneself face to face with everything. The great line from uh, the great novelist Elizabeth Bowen, to turn from everything to one face is to find oneself face to face with everything. It's been my experience that uh, I go through most of life not having any faith, not really believing at all. And something in me turns off. And in order to find God, to find any sort of faith in God, I have to turn that direction to activate it. Uh, it's there always, but it requires my attention to become almost to exist. It's, it's some sort of reciprocal relation. When the time's toxins, when the time's toxins have seeped into every cell, and like a salted plot from which all rain, all green, are gone, I and life are leached of meaning. Somehow a seed of belief sprouts the instant I acknowledge it. Little weedy, hardy, would-be greenness tugged upward by light, while deep within, roots like talons are taking hold again of this our only earth. I went through a long time of not being able to write poems, and three years actually, of not being able to write poems. And if you've made your whole life Sort of that's the way that you translate your experience and understand your life, just your, your antennae for the world. Have that taken away and everything can go pretty numb. And that happened to me for three years. And then I came out and I wrote these poems, uh, a series of circumstances that I go through and talk about in this book. I'm not going to talk about it here, but brought poetry back to me. And I was able to write poems that seemed to me to, and brought God back to me. It seemed to me I, I was able to write poems that were very, immediate. Uh, uh, they seemed easy to write and, and poetry uh, in the past has never seemed easy at all. And once again now seems terribly difficult and miserable. But for a while there, for a while there, it was easy. And, 
And so I wrote these poems which were about experience, experiences of God and some of them are in this book. And, and then I went a little further and I wrote poems that seemed to me aimed against God. They seemed to me to come out of exactly the same em energy or emotion. I would feel the same release, but they, but they seemed directed against what I had thought had given me that release. And I found it very confusing. And here's one of them called Hammer is the Prayer. This is a guy on, or up on a roof, fixing a roof after some big storm has come through and wiped out houses somewhere. And so they've, it, it begins in medias res, in the middle of things, and, and they've, it, the poem implies that they've been having some argument about what good does it do to believe in God. And this guy says, There is no consolation in the thought of God, he said. Slamming another nail in another house, another havoc had half taken. Grace is not consciousness, nor is it beyond. To hell with remembrance, to hell with heaven. Hammer is the prayer of the poor and the dying. And as wind in some lordless random comes to rest, and all the disquieted dust within, peace came to the hinterlands of our minds. Too remote to know, but peace nonetheless. It's another one. Lord of having hell at hand, Lord of losing what I have this heaven now. May I move in time like a cloud in sky, my torn form the winds, one sign. May my suffering be speechless clarity, as of water in some reach of rock it would take work to ascend and see. And may my hands, my eyes, the very nub of my tongue be scrubbed out of this hour if I should utter the dirty word eternity. If I should utter the dirty word eternity. It was not only is not a God that, that I could understand in these poems, it's, it's like a forcible renunciation of God. There's no heaven in the poem. I mean, not only is there no heaven, it's, 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 it's active contempt for the notion of any sort of eternal life. It took me a while to come to terms with poems that are in the back of this book and some of the poems that are in this book as well. And One of the things that helped was reading the great uh, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, he, he has in, in one of his late letters, he says, before God and without God, we, with, we must stand with God. We are called to be on this earth without God. Before God and with God, we must stand without God. Uh, and it began to seem to me that, that there was no line between these poems that renounced God or seemed to renounce God or, uh, and the poems that seemed to be expressions of praise or awe or joy. That they came from the same tangled place and they meant the same thing and that God could even call a person to unbelief sometimes so that faith could take new forms. Uh, about the time I was thinking about that, um, I got engrossed in this project with Osip Mandelstam that Peter mentioned. I met the poet Ilya Kaminsky, who helped me with this book, a Russian poet, fascinating guy, uh, came to the, born in the Ukraine, deaf, went deaf when he was a kid, um, uh, 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 four years old, he went deaf. Um, came to this country when he was 14, learned English, hadn't heard it spoken, now he writes in English. He has one of the best ears for poetry I've ever, I've ever heard anyone uh, um, in English. It's extraordinary. It's been my experience. I used to read, it's funny you mentioned that poem. I used to read in a very predatory way. The things I would read, I think when you're a poet, you like, you read this and it's like, you want to, you either want to do better than that or you want to, or you just want to know what they did or you want to learn from it. But there's something predatory in all of your reading, really. It's like, uh, and I, most people, that, most poets that I know are, are like that. And then it's been my experience that something changes and your reading becomes more sympathetic as you get older. And most of the reading that I do now, I do in order to make connections with people. 
someone uh, will mention a book to me and I want to talk to them about it or uh, my friend's work or whatever. Uh, and in this case, my wife was reading Mandelstam and I'd never really responded to the poems. I liked the prose, but I hadn't really responded to the poems and she was reading it. And so I began to read it and then uh, just um, coincidentally, I met Ilya and uh, he was reading at poetry and, and we went out, we hit it off. And, and um, Ilya's a funny guy. He's, like I said, he's deaf. So he, you have a conversation that's, he reads your lips and you have to stand, you know, like this close to him. And he just, he just uh, fixes on you and you can only talk about poetry. That's it. <laughs> that's it. If, this, if the conversation goes away, Ilya's eyes just go, just go like that. So we, you know, talked about poetry really hard and, and uh, he wanted me to do some Mandelstam. I was interested in, and um, um, this became a way that uh, he and I could stay in touch. Mandelstam was part of the great Russian modernists, um, one of the great Russian modernists. He, he supported the revolution when it was just beginning, but then got caught up in it pretty quickly, pretty quickly changed his mind and, and uh, got caught up in it. And, eventually killed by Stalin. Um, he and his wife, Nadezhda, they, they were always being driven around from place to place um, looking for somewhere that they could stay. He was Jewish, converted to Christianity when he was young, when he was 18 actually. Um, but a lot of Jews converted to Christianity at the time because it was the only way they could get any work. And he, he needed work, he wanted to go to school, he needed work as a translator. The weird thing is, Mandelstam converts to Finnish Methodism, which doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And it wasn't a safe choice. And um, something very perverse and specific about it. This is in Moscow when they finally, he and Adyezhda, she wrote a great book uh, called Hope Against Hope, um, which chronicles their late life together. Beautiful, lyrical prose work. I'd recommend it. Uh, here they are in... Um, in an apartment in, in Moscow, they've got a little bit of safety. Come love, let us sit together in the cramped kitchen breathing kerosene. There's fuel enough to forget the weather. The knife is ours and the bread is clean. Come love, let us play the game of what to take and when to run, of come with me and come what may and holding hands to hold off the sun. One of the amazing things about Mandelstam is his range. Uh, he can write all kinds of different poems. Let me find this one. In different tones. And in fact, he got in great trouble because of one of those poems. At the time in Russia, um, some people still have this ability. I was there not long ago. People seem to have it. But... Uh, uh, some people had the ability to hear a poem one time and uh, hear it recited, like the way you're hearing this, and then to remember it. Uh, it helped that the poems all were, were rhymed and metered. Modernism didn't take the same form in Russia that it did other places. Uh, so they were very mnemonic, but the, po but the poems were so much a part of culture that this was sort of expected, uh, that you would be able to recite poems. One evening, Mandelstam goes to this party he thinks he's around friends. It's probably a group of about this many people. And, but even friends were watching their backs by then. And he recites this poem that he's written, which is uh, just a scathing indictment of style. And it begins, We live and love, but our lives drift like mist over what we love. Two steps, we are a whisper, ten, gone. Still, we gather, we gossip, we laugh like humans, and just like that, our Kremlin gremlin comes alive. His grub worm clutch, all oil and vile. His dead weight, dead words, blonk, blonk. Listen, his jackhammering jack boots, even the chandelier shakes. Look, a hairy cockroach crawls along his grin. Stalin wasn't too happy when this got back to him as it did. Uh, it's a famous image of Stalin's mustache as a cockroach. Um, someone remembered the poem. Someone remembered it and took it back to Stalin's henchman or to Stalin himself. We don't really know. And 
a great drama ensued, which I won't go into. I urge you to read about it in Hope Against Hope. It's, it's fascinating. And Mandelstam was done for, but Stalin let him live another few years, and Mandelstam wrote his best poems in that time. Um, here's one called Herzoverse. That's my title, not his. In um, Moscow, at one place they lived, they lived next to this um, man who played the violin very badly. And he complains in his letters about hearing it over and over. Once upon a time there lived a Jew, a musical Jew, I tell you, named Alexander Herzovitz, sweet as Sherbert, his Schubert, a jewel, I tell you, a musical jewel, dawn to dusk, day after day, the same damn jewel in the same damn way. What is this salamander slivovitz, insanity's sonata? And what are you, a holy fool? Scherzovitz, enough of it. Let the dulce de leche maiden swoon Schubert through her skin. Let the children slay Allegro, this swiftness and darkness and star-sparkled snow. We're not afraid to die, you and I, to flutter down like a dove, a musical dove, to hang on a black hook like a coat and glove, a worn one-armed coat and a tattered three-fingered glove. Oh, maestro, Alexander Herzovitz, whose hands and heart are blown to bits. What in you pins you there, my lonely mister, heaven's busker, playing your sad, your same, your only air? He's very good at combining those tones like that. Funny and then suddenly not so funny. Poignant. This is one of his most famous poems, Black Candle. Your girlish shoulders are for blushing, for blushing under whips and in dawn's raw ice to shine. Your childlike hands are for pushing, for pushing flat irons and feed sacks and knotting twine. Your feet, infant tender, are for tiptoeing, tiptoeing through shattered glass in the blood-tracked clay. And I, I am for you, a black candle burning, like a black candle I am burning, and dare not pray. Sure. Your girlish shoulders are for blushing, for blushing under whips and in dawn's raw ice to shine. Your childlike hands are for pushing, for pushing flat irons and feed sacks and knotting twine. Your feet, infant tender, are for tiptoeing, tiptoeing through shattered glass in the blood-tracked clay. And I, I am for you, a black candle burning, like a black candle I am burning, and dare not pray. So he ended up in this town, in nowhere, and Voronezh, and um, late in his, his, in his last days, Mandelstam was, uh, I was going to say writing poems, but he actually didn't write them down. He was composing these things in his head. And it's the way he used to compose. Um, and he would come back and say them to his wife, and, and she would write them down, or his friends would write them down. Or, or they would just remember them. More often, those last poems, they would just remember them because it was dangerous to have them written down. Uh, you can imagine the textual difficulties that causes for some of those late poems, deciding what's the actual version. Um, sometimes he would do three, four poems a day. And he would just walking through the streets muttering these things to himself, like Wordsworth. Wordsworth wrote like that. Mandelstam was last seen, and then they picked him up and took him away, and he was last seen picking through a garbage dump uh, in Siberia, at a transit camp in Siberia. One of the greatest minds, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, one of the greatest minds, I think, of the 20th century, picking through 
a garbage dump. The last day that we have any poems for him, there's this. This could very well be his last poem. You never know, but I put it last in this book. Uh, you think about what your last statement might be. And I was alive in the blizzard of the blossoming pear. Myself I stood in the storm of the bird cherry tree. It was all leaf life and star shower, unerring, self-shattering power, and it was all aimed at me. What is this dire delight, flowering, fleeing, always earth? What is being? What is truth? Blossoms rupture and rapture the air, all hover and hammer, time intensified and time intolerable sweetness, raveling rot. It is now. It is not. The great poet, Osip Mandelstam. Let me end with a couple of poems from this new book. Um, this poem, I'll end with two poems here. This poem is, um, as I say, I grew up in West Texas. Uh, this is another sort of ours poetic, I guess. It's about I, I have a very conflicted relationship with that place. It is the seedbed of my imagination, and yet I hate it with a ferocity that I d only seems to increase. Uh, I was back there recently, and it seemed to me like I was in the, uh, the apocalypse uh, in my small town. Um, but that's my imagination doing it. Uh, when I was 16, uh, I had a I worked in the oil fields, everybody I knew did, um, and at one point we were at this uh, uh, refinery place where we were paving, our job was to pave, just pave the part of it, I don't even remember what it was actually, but um, my job was to drive the steamroller uh, for part of it, and, and this was cool, I mean if you, if you got this job when you were 16, this was great, because this was not a small steamroller, it was as big as this room, it was one of those huge steamrollers. And so you're out there in the sun, it's, you know, it's miserably hot, but, uh, but it's a cool thing to be doing when you're a kid, and, and the coolest thing is when you see a snake, when you're on a steam, steamroller and you see a snake. Um, so that's what this is about, <laughs> native. At 16, 16 miles from Abilene, Trent to be exact, hell bent on being not this, not that, I drove a steamroller smack dab over a fat black snake. Up surged a cheer from men so cheerless, cheers were grunts, squints, whisker twitches it would take a lunatic acuity to see. I saw the fat black snake smashed flat as the asphalt flattening under all ten tons of me, flat as the landscape I could see no end of, flat as the affect of distant killing vigilance it would take a native to know was love. I was obsessed with snakes when I was young, and I guess probably I still am. I wrote a whole essay about them a couple years ago about all the snakes that I've encountered in my life. Uh, and I realized it's some extraordinary stories. My father lost half of his foot to a rattlesnake, bit him three times. Uh, crazy people, man. I remember my father one of his wives coming to visit me and pulling across the, this, um, you know, in Texas, they, 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 sometimes you'll go, you'll have to drive across the creek, the little dam will be covered a little bit, but you drive across it, and so there's one of those, and, and so my father, I mean, he really hated snakes because he'd lost half of his foot, and, and uh, um, if he saw a snake, he would just kill it, no matter what it was. You know, a little grass snake, he would just blast it into oblivion. And, and so one, one time we were, we were driving across this thing, and, 
this is in South Texas. I was staying at this ranch and all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're, I'm pointing out the beauty and both he and his wife pull out guns and start shooting in the water. <laughs> and they're shooting at us. They saw a snake in there. And they both had guns. I mean, had <laughs> <laughs> Let me end in Chicago. This is, um, uh, I, for 10 years, I edited that magazine and, and I would uh, take the L into the center of Chicago and just cursing it the whole way and um, uh, you know the L is people in Chicago have a famous love-hate relationship with the L. It's, um, it's a fascinating conveyance. It's great the way it is downtown, snaking through the buildings. It's beautiful uh, but you know everybody gets crammed on there. They, you're angry in the morning, you're sweating and, and it's anyway this was one of those days and I used to go down to the stop called Grand and that's where the Poetry Magazine office used to be. Uh, I would go through another stop called Clark and Division. I mentioned that in this poem. Um, and the poem is simply a description about uh, being in one of these cars on a day when everything was going wrong and everyone seemed crammed in together and hated each other. And, and suddenly the train shot up a fantail of sparks the way it will sometime and everybody's attention turned to look at it uh, at the same time. He might help, interestingly, uh, you were friends with C.K. Williams. I wrote this poem after, the poet C.K. Williams died recently and I wrote this poem after an exchange I had had with him on email in which we had disagreed about something. and. Uh, it doesn't matter what we disagreed, but it had, it had to do with poetry and the extent to which a poem can be um, a kind of revelation that delivers you into a different kind of life. Uh, for many artists, I think they experience revelation in their work, but they don't credit it in their lives. So you have this moment when a poem opens up and you think, oh my God, where'd that come from? And then the next day it's you're dead cold to the world again. And, and you don't believe in that. You don't believe in there's anything, uh, anything other. The poem doesn't become a means of revelation that you can integrate into your life. And you can look at the lives of some poets like Philip Larkin, you can see these moments of real miracle in, in his poetry. He's a famously sour guy, but you, you see these moments of real miraculousness in his poetry that he would not allow to take form or shape in his life. Um, and so, Charlie Williams, C.K. Williams and I were going back and forth about some of this and, and I got agitated. And I got agitated about uh, um, what I couldn't believe or what I was trying to believe and trying to articulate with him and couldn't make him believe. And, and, and then I stayed up all night writing this poem. And, uh, and so I sent it to him as a response. It was really a nice exchange. and um, He was a very wonderful poet, decent man. My stop is grand. It's about what happens when you die. I have no illusion. Some fusion of force and form will save me. Bewilderment of bone light ungrave me. As when the L shooting through a hell of ratty alleys where nothing thrives but soot and the rat-like lives that have learned to eat it. Screechingly peacocked, a grace of sparks so far out and above the fast curve that jostled and fastened us into a single shock of, I will not call it love, but at least some brief and no doubt illusionary belief that in one surge of brain we were all seeing one thing, a lone, unearned loveliness struck from an iron pain. Already it was gone. Already it was bone. The gray sky and the encroaching skyline pecked so clean by raptor night I shuddered at the cold gleam we hurtled toward like some insentient Heard plunging underground at Clark and Division. 
And yet all that day I had a kind of vision that's never gone completely away of immense clear-paned towers and endlessly expendable hours through which I walked teeming human streets filled with a shine that was most intimately me and not mine. Filled with a shine that was most intimately me and not mine. I take that to be an image of Jesus. Thank you all. Thank you.